Welcome to Sustainable Packaging with Corey Connors. Today's guest is an idol of mine, frankly, Mr. Tom Zaki, the CEO of TerraCycle and Loop. Hey, Tom, how are you? Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Oh, man. I've looked up to you for years. I'm so excited to have you on the show. We met just a few weeks at Landsberg Aurora's Sustainable Packaging Summit. And uh, thank you again for agreeing to be on the show. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So I'd love to hear just a little bit about your background to set the scene for everyone. What motivated you to start this? It's amazing what you're doing. Yeah, no, so certainly, you know, I got, I got the bug for entrepreneurship at a very young age. I started my first company, which was more like, you know, graphic design, web design, that sort of thing at, at 14 years old. So I just, just before the first dot-com crash occurred, you know, like the <laughs> early 2000s. Yeah. And, you know, for me, my, my love of entrepreneurship truly came from selfish reasons. You know, I thought it was my, my clear ticket to fame and fortune, right? But those are both very <laughs> egotistical things, but nevertheless. And I had this big turning point in my first year at university. Uh, one of the first classes I took was introduction to economics and the professor gets up on stage and asks, I think actually a quite reasonable opening question, which is what's the point of business? What is the purpose of business? And long story short, the answer she was looking for was maximize profit to shareholders. And like, I get it, you know, I profit is a very vital, but to me where I landed was, I don't sort of didn't feel right with that answer to me. Profit is an indicator of health, right? Critical to be healthy. If you're profitable, you will be healthy, which equals that you'll be stable, flourish, grow, be around for a while. Well, and the opposite is true if you're not profitable. But maybe that's not the purpose. Like, we don't walk this planet to be healthy. You know, our health allows us to walk on the planet, right? And so I think that's the same for business. And so I landed at, well, you know, profit's an indicator of health. And so then the purpose should be something else and perhaps how it benefits society or the planet or both. And so I was starting to look for this concept of purposeful business, you know, my freshman year, and I landed on the topic of garbage. And then, you know, even after 20 years, it's been an eternal <laughs> fascination because like everything in the world becomes waste one day, legal property of a garbage company. And yet for how big of a concept that is, it's also the least innovative industry per dollar of revenue it has. It hasn't evolved since the 1950s. It is really uninnovative and uh, which is a playground for innovation. And in fact, not just innovation, but purposeful innovation. And uh, that's been really the genesis of, of what got me fascinated with waste and truly, you know, why I will spend my career in it, you know, since, since now 20 years. I, I love that. And that makes perfect sense. They had it backwards, I think. And I think you're right to take a, a different look at the way business should be done. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to tell us about worm poop? Yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> you know, the, the, uh, actually I'm going to, if you hold the 10 seconds, I actually show you a bottle. I have it here. Oh, moment. I'd love to see that. So <laughs> I had this fascination with garbage, but the honest story of where, where that fascination came from was my friends were growing pot in their basements in Montreal and I couldn't figure <laughs> out, you know, we couldn't ever make the plants work until they did. And they were taking organic waste, feeding it to worms, taking the resulting worm poop and feeding it to the plants. Now, to me, this was like, wow, any gardener will tell you yeah, worm poop is awesome. And so <laughs> TerraCycle's first sort of foray into innovating around waste was quite literally taking worm poop. Here's actually, this is one of our bottles. That's the worm right there. And packaging <laughs> it in used soda bottles. That's an old Coke bottle. And so it. this product outside the shrink sleeve is made and packaged in waste. Organic waste fed to worms is the, uh, is the content. And it's a used soda bottle. So a different one could be, you know, see a slightly different shape. Yeah. And this is how we began as a consumer product company, effectively making products out of garbage. That's how the entire journey of this organization began. And it taught us a lot, you know, like what is, what is it like to make products? What is it like to sell them to major retailers like Walmart and Home Depot and others? And really got a, you know, a good deep dive into the whole consumer product industry, but taking a very different angle on it. That's impressive. And, and you actually had to get permission from some of those companies to use their form factor packaging, right? Well, funny, yeah, exactly right. Like <laughs> uh, once we started getting, there was a number of interesting lessons in producing this product. I think the first is that pack waste is very standardized. Like I take this bottle and I'll take this one. You'll notice the heights are identical. Right. The, the everything, in fact, the cap tread is identical. The bottom part is identical. Everything is identical, but the silhouette. <laughs> and so you can run these through a high-speed bottling line without any challenge. And it was actually, I think, one of the first products to do that, right? Where it's all mixed use soda bottles running through high-speed bottling. The only thing that would stay is, you know, the neck ring. You could see that, you know, that one was a red, the other one was yellow. 
So that was the first is that garbage is crazy standardized. And that's incredibly important because if you can figure out how to like recycle a toothbrush in the US, it's the exact same in Japan and Brazil and France and so on. Now, but the other is that garbage does have intellectual property rights. And in this case, the intellectual property right is the shape of that iconic Coke bottle. And it was quite interesting because we got letters from the attorneys at both Coke and Pepsi saying cease and desist. Now, A, they had to do that because they have to protect their shape. I get it. And B, they were actually empirically correct, even though this was garbage. We're just pulling it out of the garbage stream and using it again. So it's funny how garbage retains intellectual yeah. property rights. And uh, which is odd though, right? I wonder if it should, it's just a question to ponder on. But nevertheless, we brought them here and where I'm sitting was all bottling of worm poop. This whole building was worm poop <laughs> bottling. And we showed them how purposeful we were. We were collecting soda bottles from schools nearby who didn't have recycling programs. So we, uh, so we were creating recycling programs for inner city schools. We're here in Trent, New Jersey, which is a you know, relatively tough, tough city. We uh, were taking organic waste from nearby restaurants, feeding it to worms, putting it into, you know, like making everything <laughs> crazy purposeful. And they very quickly said, you know what? The last thing we should do is shut you down. In fact, we should encourage you. And yeah. uh, we, we got the world's first and still only licensed to package shit in their distance. To <laughs> and, but it really opened my eyes, you know, to the power of purpose, how incredibly important it is. Just like, if you will, the power of brand, which we steward and manage a lot. But purpose is also up there and maybe even gaining more steam, but, you know, especially in the, in, in the past few years. Very good point and very true. I know the Coca-Colas and the Pepsis of the world have taken a lot of heat over the years. During recycling efforts, people would say, oh, well, look at all this waste caused by these companies. And to the point now where they're advertising, Coca-Cola is at least, don't buy our product if you won't recycle it. Right. Right. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I can't wait to talk to Tom about this. This is perfect for our show. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I give, you know, for full disclosure, both Coke and Pepsi are, are partners of ours. Great and, companies. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, look, I, I get it, right? If you're uh, Greenpeace or, or anyone and you're doing cleanups and you see what is the most littered item, you know, Coke pops up there, you know, on most yeah. lists, even at the very, very top. But I think it's, it's very important to also acknowledge that today there is no laws that force companies to be responsible for their products. You know, it, right. it's, it's at most there's taxes and, you know, maybe deposit laws, but there is no law saying well, whatever you make, you must also make sure has a proper end of life. Those laws don't exist. You know, again, the closest is if you make a package, we'll tax it. And that's EPR, <laughs> send a product responsibility right. and use those yeah. funds to boost recycling, or maybe you have to put a deposit on it. So you encourage people to get the deposit back by returning it. But yeah. really what should be, the, you know, what should happen is, manufacturers in an ideal world should have to submit their product for approval to the end of life managers to say yeah. they will be able to manage the end of life of these. Just like if you make a pharmaceutical, you have to get the FDA to say it's okay to sell. Inversely then, the end of life managers should be legally responsible to recycle those things when today, no garbage company is legally responsible to recycle anything it collects. So it's only gonna recycle what is profitable. That's a big yeah. you know, mismatch, right? And so you have, Unfortunately, every stakeholder is sort of pointing at the, at the next one. Like, you know, manufacturers are frustrated that recyclers are not advanced enough and not leaning yeah. in on these new package forms, but they're not responsible for it, right? Manuf uh, recyclers are frustrated that manufacturers are inventing all this new stuff that they don't yeah. have the equipment for. Consumers are frustrated <laughs> that like what they put in the recycling bin may not get recycled and why are, you know, and, and why are manufacturers making what they make? And it's a, I think what, you know, really, you know, we need to think about is how do we, so do what we can within you know the position we're in we're all consumers but we may also work at companies and yep. then think about how to solve that really important disconnect right because otherwise yep. we're just going to be in the same position we're in today yeah absolutely and very well said it seems like everyone continues to point fingers at each other when yep. there are solutions here and uh, i think you're doing a great job with your companies identifying some of those solutions long-term very viable realistic solutions and I think you're, you're really setting a, a path of success. So I'm excited to see where that goes. Let's talk about Loop a little bit. What, what yeah. is the Loop Alliance and, and how is that working? Absolutely. So if we look at the way we progressed the TerraCycle, like from the worm poop days, which we don't do anymore, yeah. our first major business oh, that's, unit became- that's shut down. Okay. It, it did, it did. It, we pivoted and the reason we did is when you're making a product, the product is the hero of the business. And yeah. so when we were making worm poop, yes, 
everything is garbage but you notice how this bottle looks pretty nice it's uncrushed right so we couldn't take right. crushed or you know soda bottles that have been driven over <laughs> uh, or somehow deformed right that yeah. happens in the world of recycling we were taking certain organic waste to feed the worms but not other organic waste so we realized to make a good product we're picking the very best of the garbage and we're never going to touch cigarette butts chewing gum dirty diapers right. all of the things that we've done or do today yeah. and so we pivoted out of that it was quite a painful pivot and we started our first business unit which has the value proposition that we can set up recycling programs for anything that is today not municipally or locally recyclable. Of course, you should always design into local recycling first, but in many cases, like a toothbrush or a, you know, or small complex products, it's not possible. So we can set up uh, systems to do that. From there, the second division focuses on how do we integrate waste into products? Like here's an example. This is uh, the number one dish soap in Europe, fairy dish soap. This okay. one here is made using some ocean, ocean plastic. We're the ocean plastic, but it could be rock and roll festival waste. It could be uh, the waste from the top of Mount Everest, unique inputs. And <laughs> that got us thinking a lot about, well, is that enough, you know, as a company, you know, facilitating recycling and recycled content, is that really the answer? And we realized it is not. Recycling is an imperfect solution, a band-aid, you know, at best, right? Yeah. And so we said, well, how do we go further? And the answer was, well, we have to shrink the circle from a recycling-based circular economy to a reuse-based circular economy. And as we looked at the world of reuse, we first evaluated what are the ways a consumer product company can, can enable reuse for their consumers. And we landed on three ways. You can do refill stations, which have become a lot of experiments on refill stations, you know, bulk dispensing, refilled as well, these sort of synonyms. You could also concentrate your product and have an example, like this is Hello, where you get an empty bottle, you get a little pill, you know, a tablet, yeah. you put it in and then you dilute it. That would Love be that. concentrate filling or sachet filling, right? Where you get bulk and fill over. And then there's, pre which is when the container's already full and you just return the empty, like our propane tanks in the US yeah. or our beer kegs. Yeah. So the first thing we looked at, oh, exactly right. Like Clorox, <laughs> uh, like those Clorox wipes, that's right. <laughs> and so the first thing we asked ourselves is in those three modalities, how many products could play in them? And interestingly, only so many products can go through refill stations. For example, you would never do Tylenol in a refill station. You would never <laughs> do insect right. repellent and uh, alcohol and... Frankly, about 80% of all the products on shelf either technically couldn't go through a refill station, like frozen falafel balls would be not so easy, <laughs> or you couldn't safely. I'd like to see that. That'd yeah. be good. Yeah. <laughs> right? But, you know, or couldn't safely or legally do so, right? right. So that's, you know, it's, it, it, it's a very small market. Even fewer things can be effectively concentrated. Now, you can concentrate hand soap very well, but mm -hmm. you're not concentrating even tomato ketchup, you know, let alone latex paint or, you know, all these different things. And we found pre-fill. Frankly, anything in a disposable package can go into a prefill because it's all you're doing is changing the durability index of the package. So that was really interesting. So I said prefill we felt was like the place to focus for that reason. Yeah. It is also today the biggest scaled reuse in the world. It's the beer industry of Canada. It's the beverage industry of Germany. It is propane tanks and beer kegs here. Yeah. And so the question was, what's the issue? What's stopping it from, you know, taking over everything? And, you know, we thought like take the beer keg and the propane tank. Isn't it interesting that when they're both empty, you can't take the beer keg to where you bought the propane. You can't take the propane tank to where you bought the beer keg. <laughs> so they right. create what you would call mono supply chains. Now in a asset value item that's high, like a propane tank, and you get whatever, like 25 bucks back. Okay. You're going to schlep it to the place and it'll be fine. Beer keg yeah. is probably even more. But what if it's a 50 cent item, 25 cent item, you know, like, like a Coca-Cola or a, or a, a you know, a, a tomato ketchup or a Nutella, you know? And yeah. it's also problematic if you have to remember where to return it. We mix items all the time at home. Like I may right. shop somewhere and my wife may shop somewhere and uh, someone may give things to me and it all becomes a big sort of combined thing. And so as we thought about that, we said, well, prefill is where, where one should focus, but we have to solve that issue. And so Loop is a platform for reuse. And the platform works in two stages. We first work with consumer product companies, you know, like you showed Clorox or like Cas that's Cascade, you know, with yep. Dr. and Gamble. And Beautiful. They package. have to, yeah, it's quite nice, right? They have to develop reusable versions of their products. Our formal role is to approve what's in your hand, that it's durable and cleanable. Yep. And our informal role is to ensure that the company can actually get that across the finish line, helping connect them to packaging suppliers like that. I think Kohler makes that particular product for Clorox, which is it's interesting. Beautiful. Very yeah, well right? designed. Yeah. But and something we'd like to keep on our counter, right? Yeah. Right, right. And so that's the first step, right? Now, 
there's many ways to achieve it, right? One is you can use, in some cases, existing packaging is conducive to reuse. Think like a glass peanut butter container. It's yeah. actually made durably enough that it could be reusable. So that's, uh, you know, or the iconic Kraft Heinz uh, tomato ketchup bottle or, you know, many other examples. Stubbs barbecue sauce, you know, totally yeah. conducive in the way it is already. So you can do a lot of existing packaging, just maybe change right. the label adhesive technology so it can come off a bit quicker and that sort of stuff and cleaning. Yeah. Then there's a lot of opportunity to use stock packaging. A stock would be like this container. This is Tide, laundry detergent, beautiful container, yeah. but this is a package that they repurposed from a different container use, right? Mm. And made it into, you know, it's not, it's not a custom mold in other words, right? Okay. There's a lot of opportunity there. Just in Google, put in the word container instead of the word package, right? Yeah. There's a huge industry of containers, massive. Yeah. Think like 50% of Americans decant their hand soap at home. How many of <laughs> us decant coffee and other things into containers? Yeah. Or like spices, do we think about the huge industry of amazing spice containers, right? Like, yeah. you know, if you're a McCormick and you're working with Loop as they are, you don't <laughs> have to invent a new spice container, pick from the 10,000 existing ones yeah. and off you go. And, and we'll reuse is, it. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and then you have what you showed, which are truly the magic, the bespoke designs, like really yeah. custom, amazing. Beautiful. And you can do some phenomenal things with that. Like Ajinomoto in Japan, a big food company is integrating sure. real-time IoT into the package sensing its temperature and humidity. So you can log into the package and see a variable expiration date, depending on how you store it. <laughs> wow. And consumers get into these products for three reasons. Sustainability, certainly it's reusable, not disposable. It's also way more beautiful, way more counterworthy, as they say. And third, <laughs> in, in, topic, in uh, topicals and ingestibles, there's a perception of an increase of health. And I use choicefully the word perception because I don't actually know the data on, you know, what's healthy or getting your ketchup from a plastic squeeze bottle or a, or a glass bottle. But, yeah. but people will project that the glass one is healthier, right? We just don't know. We don't have that stuff. And so that's the first step. And then the second step is we work with retailers, you know, from Kroger and Walgreens to Carrefour and Tesco, even Eon out in Japan, who then create sections of their stores. So like an organic section, but for reuse, well, all these top brands, like we're not talking, you know, like just niche brands, like all top tier brands put their reusable products there. And we've seen like consumers love it. You know, they, yeah. they, uh, they will have, they have an 80% chance of shifting brands to get the reusable 80% wow. shift preference. So it's very much incremental, non-cannibalistic, really, really good sales rates, 80 to 70 to 80% of the packaging comes back, which is three wow. times the rate of recycling in the U S which is quite high. Um, there are some really, really nice sort of pieces. So where Loop is now is we're live in UK, France, Japan, Canada, US, and uh, really the, over the next few years, it's all about scaling, you know, uh, and Portland, uh, Oregon. And yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Uh, that's Portland, where Oregon I got Kroger. all. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the first place to go, to go live was Oregon with Kroger. And then we have uh, three major retailers launching in Q3 in various parts yeah. of the U S. I was so excited to go to Fred Meyer, which is owned by Kroger and, and to see your shelf full of. I, I stood there for like a half hour looking at all this stuff, taking videos, taking pictures to the, to the point where people are looking at me like, who is this guy? What's he doing? I'm like, this is what I live for. I love this stuff. You know, yeah. Let, just, just leave me alone. I'll buy a bunch of things, you know? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but it's, it's exciting. You know, I think we're at the very beginning of where this can go, but like for us, I think it's, it's it, the, the range. It, I don't think we use this for everything, mind you, but it can really hit a lot. Like with, with the big retailer in the UK, we're launching clothing later this year. We've already launched oh, wow. cloth diapers. So even beyond your traditional consumables, right? And think anything like caulking to latex paint, you know, to insect repellent in the hardware category, right? All the way to, you know, automotive consumables. I mean, there's so many areas where, where applicability can go. And then as you go to hard goods, I mean, I, I know uh, technically clothing would be called the soft good, but I mean like more non-consumables, right? Like from games to clothing. It, you can play the same model. It's just what you're sharing is not the package, but the actual object. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. I haven't thought about that. I know there's a big issue in the fashion industry with what they call fast fashion and yes. clothes that, that wear out too fast. I read a really great book about that called Rubbish, where they talked about the how all most of our clothing ends up in Vietnam or these, you know, countries that will yes. even literally pick the hair out of it to be used to make wigs out of. I thought that was a fascinating, <laughs> like, yeah. wow. Well, and you're absolutely right. I mean, he'll like, give you the numbers on clothing. Like there's such an amount of fast fashion or, you know, clothing that, uh, and usually, you know, today the average person in a Western market 
only wears clothing three times before disposal on average. Three wears before disposal. I mean, just to put it into perspective, and we buy 10 times more clothing. Oh, sorry, I, I apologize. Someone alive 100 years ago bought two apparel items per year. Today, it's 66. Wow. 66 that, per yeah. year. And wow. so now, now think about it, right? We uh, go down to our church and, or Goodwill and put it in the bin. And we, what is the perception? Oh, it's all going to be resold in a vintage store here in the US. Yeah. 3% is what's resold. Yeah. 97% is bailed and sold by kilo into emerging markets. The name of it they give is dead white man's clothing is the, you know, the, what you would call it in like Northern Africa. But then wow. when someone buys it by the kilo there, you know, only one third is resold locally. And this is the problem. Two thirds are dumped. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really tough. So in loop, for example, the way we look at it is think about the business objective, right? In fast fashion, the goal is to make the price of the clothing as low as possible. And the retailer makes money on volume. Right. And the way we're launching it with Loop is instead of buying the item, you pay a deposit and you pay a use fee. Now, it's not like a rental. You could hold it for years, you know, whatever you want. And you can keep it if you want. And then you just never get your deposit back. And hmm. you're out the use fee no matter what. But if you <laughs> return it, right, you get your deposit back. Now, check it out for the consumer. The consumer will get a higher quality item because the item is made to be durable at like half the price if they return it and they don't have any garbage. Think for baby clothes where we're starting, where you go through items very, very quickly. Yeah, but that's perfect. For the, for the yeah. retailer, you make more money on the, sec on the item going around than ordering a new one. The cost of cleaning it, putting it on a hanger is cheaper than buying a new item. So the retailer's Brilliant. margin goes up. Awesome. And the only thing that happens, there is a loser here. The loser is the <laughs> manufacturer makes less. Sure. Yeah. Well, but frankly, they can't keep up with demand anyways. So that's certainly, that and they may be probably able to make higher help. quality items, right? So they can do a higher price point item, but lower volume. And I think that's the big mega sort of, I mean, the big white elephant in the room, if you will, is our volume is way too high, Yeah. right? As people, and when I say volume, our volume of consumption is wildly over-indexed, just wildly over-indexed. And doesn't matter how you know, sustainable, you know, those products are in their creation. Yeah. It's way too much net stuff. So yeah. what we're going to have to, you know, resolve to as people is to bring down our volume. Now you can yeah. bring down volume, you know, typically people will hear that at sacrifice, but a way to maintain the same amount of, you know, spending, if you want to like, you know, fuel the economy is as you bring down volume, bring up quality. Right. All right. And then yeah. you may be spending the same amount, but on fewer items. Buy one nicer shirt instead of exactly. three less quality. Yeah. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the, the deposit on this was, was $10, but I was happy to pay it because I knew I'd get it right back. You know, well, the you know what's time. interesting about that one? So yeah. we talk about deposit theory, right? That's the highest deposit in the ecosystem, right? The average yeah. deposit's like, you know, 50 cents, 75 cents. The lowest, I think, is 10 cents, right? But yeah. that, that particular one is the highest. But here's the cool part. That exact container, you can buy empty today, and it will retail, depending on the retailer, between $22 and $29.99. <laughs> so you're so getting you a discount. It, my gosh, <laughs> you can buy it filled with wipes cheaper yep. than the thing empty substantially cheaper oh and whenever you're done you can get your money back if you so wish and then this is the interesting part about deposit theory it actually still costs in that example clorox less to acquire that pack than the deposit so if you choose to keep it they're making a profit on the package Every, like you said there there's there's so many ways to win at this and it all yes. makes sense for the environment yeah. I had an awesome conversation with a couple of recycling people a few weeks ago, one from the United Can the Manufacturers Institute and one from bottles, glass bottles, and they were talking about recycling rates. And states like Oregon that have bottle deposits have a double factor of recycling rates, states that don't. Do you feel like that will go nationally and internationally eventually? So the biggest types of legislation one can do within this whole circular economy space is zoom out, right? Is one end is banning things. Seattle, ban this drop. New Jersey, ban the plastic bag as examples. Those are good, but they're very symbolic, right? To sort of nip at the heels of disposability. Yeah. Within recycling, there's two primary legislation forms. Well, really three, if you will. One is DRS or deposit return schemes, which would be here in the US called bottle bills which is exactly what you're describing. And they always, always, always increase rates. 
but they're lobbied, you know, around the, the, the lobby who will try to push them away pushes, uses the argument it increases prices. But net net, the more DRS or bottle bills, the better, right? And it's straight up. You also have EPR, which is finally coming to the United States. You know, states have now started passing it, more liberal states, but hopefully this will, you know, roll out across the country. And that is extended product responsibility, which is like a packaging tax. That tax everyone pays and it goes into funding recycling. So things that are profitable to recycle, more of it will be recycled. And then some things that are maybe just on the edge may fall over. It doesn't mean everything will be recycled, but more investment will occur into recycling. And it's a wonderful thing. You also have truth in advertising, like a Senate Bill 343 in California is a really good example of this. And there's many of those, uh, many states are doing copycat legislation. This is a wonderful legislation, which is moving from just the ability to claim recycling by having access, which is how the FTC governs it, to also showing that it is actually being recycled. And that's going to mean a lot of uh, package forms, like many polypropylene package forms that today have the recycling logo, will not be able to have it later. But that's yeah. good stimulus because it's going to move them to innovate. And so those are the ones within recycling. And then there's a lot of pro-reuse legislation coming as well. Like Vancouver just passed the tax on disposable cups where you have to pay 25 cents huh. more if you get your beverage in a disposable cup, but no tax if it's reusable. And those would be like pro-reuse legislations. And like all Vancouver or BC? Yeah. Uh, British Columbia. Yeah. yeah. France, Amazing. for example, passed it even more aggressively where they said if you're a restaurant and your customer eats in or drinks in, it must be in a reusable container. Now, if you think about a normal restaurant experience, you'd probably say like, that's pretty normal. But think if you're McDonald's or Starbucks, that's not normal. <laughs> that, now that's a big change. And we should talk about Burger King and Tim Hortons and yeah. your, and I believe McDonald's is going to be right. part of that too. Uh, let's talk about that. that. That packaging system for Loop is incredible. Yeah, so so we are we've talked a lot about the FMCG category, yeah. you know, fast moving consumer goods, and there we have you know a lot of home care, personal care, beverage, packaged food, you know all all those players, but we're also working with brands like McDonald's. This is their you know Loop Best. This is live in the UK, awesome. so you can get this at select restaurants. Of course, with Burger King sodas and sandwich containers. And the important part about all this is today in the UK, you can go to a McDonald's, buy your coffee in a reusable vessel, but drop it off at a Tesco. Then at the Tesco, buy your laundry <laughs> detergent and tomato ketchup and reusable vessel and drop it off at Burger King and, you see con and mix it all together and so on. And that's got to be convenient. Right. It has to. And that was yeah. my biggest learning in all of this is it's not about will someone pay more for the organic product. Right. It's is it convenient first and foremost? And yeah. if it's convenient enough, then tell me about the features and benefits. And then if I like those, then tell me about the price. Yeah then yeah, price doesn't matter because you've saved me your service level and convenience level is so high. It's 10 bucks, who cares? Uh, I'll get it back. Well, and you get it back uh, you know. anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing yeah. with reusable packaging is what, as it scales, it is as competitive economically in most cases to yeah. disposable. And there's a lot of very interesting stimuli that pop out. You know, the package becomes an asset. There's profit on package loss. And there's also these interesting new theories that don't play in disposable goods. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. So back to TerraCycle for a minute. I'm amazed that you can recycle cigarette butts and diapers and chewing gum. How long did that process take to figure out? And frankly, how many people did it take? How many scientists did it take to figure out how to recycle those things? Absolutely. So each waste stream is like a different animal. And now what it has in common is you have to figure out how to collect it. You have to figure out how to process it. And you have to figure out the business model that funds that to occur. So we zoom out. The first thing to note is more or less everything in the world is technically recyclable. With enough science and process, you can recycle just about anything. What makes something practically recyclable is if a garbage company can make money. Mm -hmm. What like an aluminum can. What yeah. makes something practically not recyclable, like a cigarette butt, is if a garbage company can't make money. <laughs> right? Because remember, garbage companies are for-profit enterprises. They have no legal responsibility to recycle anything. So they're only going to recycle what they can make money on. It'd be like the difference between littering on the street gold, everyone's going to pick it up, or littering on the street poop, everyone's going to avoid it, right? <laughs> and so Very true. The, the, the first and most important thing is actually the business model, getting an actor to fund it, yeah. which could be the producer, could be the retailer, could be the city that all this happens in, it could be the place of consumption, it could be the consumer. In all cases, figuring out why someone's going to bother paying and funding, and then getting them to fund more. That's the yeah. first. 
Then we have to figure out how do we collect it in a way that is affordable to the funder, safe for the consumer. You know, in some waste streams like razor blades, diapers, you know, there's major safety questions, you know, a pharmaceutical packaging and so on. How to do that in a way as well that is not just safe and affordable, but exciting and, you know, where people are consuming that. So it's, you know, when you think collection, it's not just the box, but about all these different things that come around and yeah. how we collect cigarette butts, which is typically in, in, on city streets, you know, with little receptacles is very different than how we collect dirty diapers. Um, but that's more like an operational innovation and sort of human insights. And then you have the part that you're asking about, which is then how do you process it, right? And yep. so we have a team of scientists. We're about 600 people here at TerraCycle doing you know, work like you see me and folks that are walking around. And a good number of scientists at both chemical and mechanical processes. And they first figure out the technical solution. Then we have an operations team who finds vendors and processors who then implement those technical solutions to create the practical solutions. And that Amazing. gets the supply chain up and running. And then from there, it's about constantly making it, tightening the screws and making the quality of the outputs better and more higher end. Amazing. So what does a cigarette butt, for example, turn into as a, on the, on the other side as a reusable or as a consumed item? Absolutely. So something like a cigarette butt is shredded and we separate the organic bits, which is the ash tobacco paper, which goes to composting. Mm -hmm. And then the really cool technology we developed was getting the paper off the filter, right? And getting those things separated. Yeah. The filter is made from cellulose acetate, which is the same polymer as your eyeglass frames, if those happen to be plastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I didn't know that. And so cellulose acetate can then be made into a plastic granule or a, or a powder or a pellet, those would be the raw material outputs. And then those can be integrated into new products, ashtrays, pallets, eyeglass frames could be, but probably wouldn't be appropriate for a cigarette butt. But nevertheless, <laughs> it's those sort of outputs is what you get. Well, that's amazing. And I think we're going to see, I, I'm always thrilled to see in like a Disneyland or a someplace like that, where they have a trash receptacle that's made out of recycled mm. bottles. Yes. Or, you know, I was at San Diego Zoo, you know, 800 bottles took to make this trash can like well that's perfect you know yeah. that's a just a that makes a lot of sense right well i've got lots more questions but uh, let, let's see which one's most important here oh what's the number one item that TerraCycle gets back for recycling oh it's a good good question i don't know what the number one is but some of the very popular ones would be cosmetics now you know with the pandemic yeah. uh, although that's that's gonna hopefully go down flexible food packaging you know things like contact lenses those would just be some examples of some of the more high volume outputs like the actual lens you can recycle the lens and the packaging certainly yeah wow that's incredible yeah that's incredible well what I know this is a big question, but what's the future of sustainable packaging? Is it, is it reuse? Is it recycling? Is it all these things together? Yeah, I think, look, there's not one silver bullet. Uh, right. We live in a very complex world with lots of, com you know, like lots of different need cases. And, and uh, you know, even a certain product may have on the go needs, portion control, fault, you name it, right? Yeah. So I think in the short term, recycling is what we have to really focus on because everything is disposable, more or less. I mean, that's a broad statement, but more or less, right? Yeah. And so we need to really think through how to get bigger, better recycling services. And there's no one answer. I mean, TerraCycle is not, you know, in a vacuum, the answer. It's a whole ecosystem of solutions. Yeah. Then while we shore that up in the short term, we need to think about, I believe, alternative methods of delivery and consumption, which is where reuse comes, but it may not be limited to one modality of reuse or even three modalities. Yeah. There may be many ways to... Think about it. And there you're not just editing the package, but you're also editing the business model in which the package flows, which is quite interesting because you can only innovate an object so much. But then when you innovate the business model, you can have even more potential outputs because you're adding another multiplier, another variable to it. I think though, you know, so that would be what I'd say in the short term and the medium term. In the long term though, the most important thing that we have to think through is reducing consumption. Right. That is you, really going to be the most important. Use so, less, right? Yeah. So I would say like, you know, if you're doing package innovation and product innovation, the first thing is how do we eliminate the need of the product altogether? And then how do we make the product as less stuff as humanly possible? Dehydrating like shampoo bars, concentrating, package free, you know, those yeah. sort of things. Then how do we create short-term solutions like recycling and then long-term innovations like reuse and then keep pushing. But I think those are the key sort of questions, reduction, both in personal consumption and how products exist. And then about how to circular, we can make it. Excellent. 
Do you have any advice for, for those of us? Most of my listeners are in the packaging industry. Yeah, I think- Could you give I, us I, a few words? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the biggest breakthrough I have seen, is, and this came from Loop, but I think it's, there's a good learning here, which is usually designers are really stuck in the object design, right? That thing, you know, that, that, that three-dimensional object and what material, how cheaply can I make it? You know, what cost can I make it for? What function does it have? Can it squeeze? Can it drop? Can it do this? Can it do that? <laughs> That's where we're stuck. And there are limits to how much we can do there, right? There really are. It's just like if you're a graphic designer doing the labeling, the two-dimensional artwork, there is so, there's many limits on what you can do on the art. You can only design into the shape and you may only be able to use a certain number of colors and this, that, and the other. The biggest place, I think the future of package innovation will not be the two-dimensional or the three-dimensional, but it will be the business model in which the package flows. And that can be fundamentally magical what you can do. You know, by changing the package from being a cost to an asset, you can suddenly invest orders of magnitude more into it, you know, tea, all sorts of different things. And so that's a really unexplored area. And I think there's a lot of richness in, in thinking through the next dimension, which in this case, is the model, the business model, the model of ownership, uh, the way it flows. How does it leave the consumer versus just going into a, a landfill or a recycling output? I love that. I think that the first time I saw the, I think it's, I think it's haagen yes, brand yes, of ice cream. Yes, the yeah. first time I saw that aluminum container and it was described on your website as this keeps it colder longer. Yes, that's right. I thought, okay. We can make packaging better. Yeah, yeah. We can go the other way. For so long, we've been going, how can we make this lighter? How can we lightweight this? How can yes. we make it Remove less? Remove cost, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. 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 Cheaper, 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 cheaper. Yes. And now you you flip the switch and said, no, let's go the other way. Let's yes. reuse it a thousand times and amortize that cost over that many and save us all a fortune and, and save the planet. Yeah. So it still can go cheaper. It's just, you have to buckle it the other way. In a way. And <laughs> right. I think this is some of the sort of interesting places to play. And luckily yeah. there's a lot of tailwind from, you know, the consumers, retailers, you know, there's a lot of leaning in on this type of thinking. Yeah. And from the, the businesses manufacturing product, you know, I, I live in Portland, Oregon. We've always been very green city yes. and town 20 years ago. People said, we want to go green, but then I would say, well, it costs 15% more. It's like, mm, maybe next year. Now they don't care. Let's yes. do it. Yes. We need to do it. We have to do it. Here's why yes. our customers won't buy our product if we're not, if we're not sustainable. So, and it's more and more, I think you're yeah. going to see more and more consumers saying that you're also going to see legislation making it easier to do that, you know, making it more costly to be linear and more affordable to be circular. Totally agree. Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. How, how really can we appreciate your time? Uh, how can we sign up to help? What is it? Cycle.com. Check out, check out terracycle.com. We actually yeah. just relaunched it and look at all the free programs and you can learn about loop. You can learn about all sorts of things, even diagnostics from our, from our platform. Well, thank you so much and hope to have you on again someday and really Anytime. appreciate it. Let's do it. I look forward to hanging out again. This was a really fun conversation. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. See you later.